Guys, thanks for taking the time out to talk to Uber Rock today. Um, it's been a while, as I said, it's been four years since too we long, last. Too long. Yeah, it's been four years since we last talked mm. at Abitaleri, my hometown. Mm. Now, now you're in Cardiff. Yep. The capital of Wales, the only team left in the Euros. Yeah. The football. Ah, so we're yeah, here. So that's, that's a big deal. Yeah, yeah. Um, first of all, I have to say beforehand, the, um, happy birthday to Richard for yesterday. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, thank you for taking the time, especially for making it to the interview today. Easy, uh, yeah, easy breezy. That's cool. Um, so, guys, I wanted to start by talking about the current UK tour. Um, your, I believe, I've got to check my notes here, six dates into eight date tour. Um, oh, just for the UK, yeah, yeah. Just for the UK, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, what's it been like so far with the UK moving up again to bigger venues and, and things like that? What's it been like? It's been the most amazing thing for us. Um, we were talking, we were, where did we play the other day? Glasgow. And um, Glasgow is one of our, our really big connective cities. We, we're connected to a lot of cities, but Glasgow has been one of these big things for us. We did um, our first live DVD there, and for some reason, every time we go back, it gets bigger and bigger. But we played this venue. And for us, this tour has been odd because you walk into these venues and it just seems so huge. Yeah. And a lot of people think that we take it for granted because we toured with a lot of big people and we played, you know, big stadiums and arenas and things that you don't even think of a small room as big. But yesterday, we walked into the old fruit market in Glasgow the day before yesterday. It was so vacuum. The space mm -hmm. was just huge and, and, and kind of cavernous. It was hard for me to believe that we were going to fill that room. And then at night, it was full. So... It's, it's, it's something to get used to. Yeah, It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's really nice, but this tour has been um, validating, makes you feel excited about the stuff you've done in the past. You know, um, we have a, uh, we've upped our set design and light design, and that's cool. been really exciting. You know, we've got a great crew and a great team. Um, it's, it's, it's besides just the things that people would think make a tour amazing, it's actually just the acknowledgement that the, that the snowball you're trying to have occur has been happening. And it's been really nice to see and feel. And it feels personally brilliant to see it because we were there from the start, as we yeah. say. Mm -hmm. um, so to see a band that we saw the potential in right from those early gigs, you know, mm -hmm. the Camden Barfly with Brian yeah. Sands, which Russ was at. Yeah, yeah. So that, I believe that was your first UK show, wasn't it? Well, Apart from yeah, a few yeah, showcases. Yeah, 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 sure, sure, sure. It's um, also something like, you know, you know, we, know that we know our promoters. Like, we know yeah. we're good friends with the promoters because luckily um, we, every time we've been back, we've kind of stuck with the same ones in each area. And it's been nice to hear the promoters talk about how the numbers double every time we come back. Um, you know, a lot of times before we go on stage, you know, there's, there's sometimes the room will be empty right before you go on. Um, and or either sometimes we can do some of these festivals we've been doing, the space yeah. empty. And every time we kind of say, maybe this is going to be that time. Knock on wood, it hasn't happened yet, where maybe it's just going to be an empty show. <laughs> but but you're selling the venues <laughs> out. Yeah. But you're selling the venues out. I know, time, it's, it, but it, it's, it's, still, it's still something to get used to. And on top of that, I, it, not only the, the, the sales, which is like Ty said, it was, it was real validating, but we started off uh, with very... We're, in a, we're a live band, and we, we like trying things out in front of a live audience, and the UK was, was very, uh, especially early on, was very opening... You know, comforting as far as uh, letting us kind of experiment and, and try things yeah. out. And, and what's nice is with all this coming back this time, we're still putting that out there. And the, and the you know the UK family is letting us you know giving us the freedom to, to experiment and try things and float new material out there that's not even recorded and yeah, stuff like that. Good. So it's good. Um, you mentioned you've been doing a lot of festivals. Of course, after the UK, you go off to do more festivals and then. The US, which I'll come on to in a second, because I'm yeah. really particularly interested to know about how that tour came about, or will be coming about. But Secret. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll tell you off camera. All right, okay. Um, but I wanted to ask you about one gig in particular, because I love that festival. Brilliant. So I'm gonna, uh, I think it's a brilliant festival. I think I know. Uh, mm -hmm. Back two weeks, <laughs> yeah. Hellfest. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what, was, what was that like? Because you must have trucked up there thinking, oh my God, and then... <laughs> That, that reaction. Yeah, it, was, yeah. it was really pretty cool, and I got to put it on myself because I was really worried about it personally. And we you know, were saying that we're going to we have to kind of fit our rocky part of our, our band towards it. But yeah, Ty really stood up, and it was good. You know, no, we should do our regular things, you know, and, and it proved to be really right. It was amazing to see um, that 
kind of energy at that type of festival. Yeah, yeah. And I think, it, you know, I mean, it ended up being about 40,000 people when we yeah. played, and the yeah. response was... It's a massive place And to well, see guys in Motorhead yeah. t-shirts, yeah, yeah, and, you yeah. know, they're all dancing yeah. and but, singing. But, but music shouldn't right. have any boundaries, should it? No, really? no, if it's a good band, it's a good rock and roll band, or yeah. rock and soul, as I call it. Yeah, sure, sure. It's from time to time, you know, what, what's the difference? Right. I know? think it played yeah. to our advantage, too, is that it's just that, that we didn't, you know, we're not like most of the other bands there and the beautiful thing is like you said there was a guy on the front row I remember with a Slayer shirt on and knew, <laughs> knew every Everyone. word you yeah, know yeah. and I, I think it just it helped kind of you know correct our, our or remind us you know don't judge a book by its cover and things like that and even the shout out to Rival Sons I think Ty, Ty made the great call after talking to the Rival Sons guys earlier to put a to put a ballad in the middle of the set, you know, not alright by me, and, yeah, yeah. and you know probably our slowest tune, yeah, yeah. and it wound up hitting the hardest, you Brilliant. know, and so it's it's just again a testament to, um, you know, don't believe everything, and you know until you're there enough I, in it, man, give I, give, I, give, I, yeah, give anything a chance. I've been twice. Um, I went last year, but not this year. It was the last time with last year, and. The people there are so friendly. Absolutely, yeah, it's beautifully and organized. It's incredible. just yeah. the, the UK. I know you play a lot of festivals out of the UK and everything else, but the UK could learn a lot about how to run a festival from Hellfest. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. They really could. It's amazing. Really could. I mean, not only that for us too. I think besides just style of music, um, it was what was in the air at the time. The zeitgeist of the, of the of the period was very had a lot of friction because of the big vote and everything that was going to happen, and so. Not only was it just a slow song and a ballad, it was a song that spoke about. It's a song called "Not Alright by Me," by the way. Yeah, yeah. And it was, you know, it's a song that talks about, um, you know, it's having a real voice, and and everyone at the time was just ha trying to have their voices be heard in the audience. So I think um, not only us holding our guns, but also the fact that um, it was in the air, the, 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 that feeling of 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 a people wanting to be heard and understood was in the air. So I think that worked to our advantage as well. Um, because as soon as you started singing the song, you saw people, sw a lot of times we have to prompt a the movement in the audience. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, before yeah, yeah. we even got to, the audience got it, and you looked around, and not only did you see the people in the Motorhead shirts getting along to the song, you saw them crying. Mm -hmm. And you know, when, it, when, when everyone sang along, it wasn't only to the stage, you saw people just looking up and singing, and people were having real personal moments as well as a communal 40,000 person moment. And so, I don't know about any other performers in the world, but you know, you, we kind of grow up idolizing things like Woodstock and um, idolizing people like Marvin Gaye and Bob Dylan for writing songs that actually did something and Marley. meant something. So the idea of, 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 of Not All Right By Me happening in the middle of this sea of people, no matter what kind of music they listen to, and you can tell they were feeling it, and you can tell it was adding some kind of band-aid to them for the time, that was, probably one of the biggest moments that we've had or will have in a long time because that goes beyond music that is um i don't know you do, we do a lot of you do a lot of preaching not just us musicians in general that says it's not just about the music but there aren't a lot of times that you get to really feel it yeah and that was one of those times yeah so what you're just telling me was going to lead lovely into my next question which was about obviously you're going back to the states to tour with the dixie chicks mm -hmm. Now what you've just said to me, it doesn't seem such a... So far, right? Yeah, that's yeah. so far a stretch. No, yeah. it doesn't, because what They're those very, girls stand for, yeah, and the voice that they've got in the US, mm -hmm. you know, um, sure. you know, all power to them. Yeah. They've stood up and yeah. they've done exactly what Ty said. They, exactly. they, they've said what they believe. You put their money where their mouth is. Yeah, yeah. Actually, it was here in the yeah. UK, right? Sure. This all happened, I think. Did it? The no. famous no. gig. When yeah, yeah. She, oh, had, yeah. she was, was talking here. about Texas yeah. from here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, not only that, I mean... Everyone thinks it's a it's a coincidence or an odd alignment too, but we were just sitting around talking. We were talking about our gigs every night. And what happens when you know when our Dixie chicks and <laughs> fun with phonetics by Ty Taylor. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. What yeah. happens when our Dixie chicks? You know, one, one, one thing <laughs> we do talk about. Though, you know, we we do talk about you know what troublemaking is. You know, because our fans are called troublemakers. Absolutely, yeah. And um, you know, troublemaking is about coming out and having a great time, and you know, getting crazy with your friends at a vintage trouble show. But you know, troublemaking also goes back to like you know a Martin Luther King, for example, or you know, not to put you know these ladies in the same sentence, but you know, the Dixie Chicks are somebody who has caused trouble for the good. So, you know, yeah. troublemaking is about, you know, questioning the status quo and, and you know, standing up and, and you know, really 
believing in something and not being afraid to cause friction in doing it. And, um, you know, we really love that about our troublemakers as well, you know. So um, the Dixie Chicks are troublemakers <laughs> in all the right ways. I think yeah. I saw a documentary, too, with them on the last record or whatever where Chad Smith came in from yeah. the Ch Chili Peppers yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and was like, man, these chicks are badass. They rock, you know. And then you hear him pounding out the, the beats on their, on, their, on their stuff. And it's just, you know, it's, uh, it's cool. It's, let's, let's kick up some trouble. You know? so, so you've gone from ACDC to Dixie Chicks. <laughs> and, but well, in reality, it's... It's, it's rock yeah. and roll, isn't it? At the yeah. end of the day, it's yeah. not. It's yeah. great for us because it's such a different audience. Of course, you know, ACDC was uh, has been really helping us here in Europe and, yeah. and the UK as far as touring. Now you see a, a lot of their fans coming to our shows. It's yeah, and they downstairs with what shows. Yeah, 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 they constantly yeah. stay in touch with us, and and it's really cool to see. You know, because we're quite different than them, but in a way, very similar. Okay. <laughs> so I think it's going to be a similar audience to. Um, and we've done it here in the UK as, as the Paloma Faith audience. I think yeah. it's going to be very similar yeah. to the Dixie Chicks. You know, because she also is, is a rebel. You know, she represents, you know, a, a, a lot of strength for, for women and a lot of, you know, moxie, my mom would say. Well, she's yeah. outspoken. Um, yeah. Outspoken. So I think, um, and it's been nice because when we toured with her in the UK, we did notice that there was this beautiful... Um, of rocking, but a, a softness to the energy of the audience, and it's been nice to see a lot, of, um, a lot of women that have come to the show because of Paloma Faith. And I think you know we talk about Dixie Chicks. You know our management is from Nashville. You know we have a connection to the country music world, yeah. and um, it'll be nice to to gather those kind of people along with us in the states because it's, it's such an important audience to perform in front of. Because a lot of times, country music listeners, um, they are fine-tuned music ears. Mm. Because, you know, whether you like country music or not, you can't deny that some of the most amazing and long-lasting melodies of all time have been written by country music artists. And so th their audiences come and they really pay attention. I remember the first time we played there, we played Nobody Told Me. And this thing at the end of the bridge goes big, 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 and this goes sweeps into a soft section and that was the first time we got, we got applause for that so that listening ear is going to be nice to actually play in front of as well yeah, I mean, because they they know their songs yeah you know? it's funny i was uh, a few years back i was talking to todd youth guitarist from danzig mm -hmm. and a few other bands mm -hmm. and um i just said to him i said you play guitar with glenn campbell why and he's just fucking glenn campbell man yeah. exactly you know i could play wichita line man every night <laughs> you know why wouldn't i do that yeah, you I'm know nice. It's mm -hmm. no different. I play with guitar for Mort Red, I'll play guitar for Glenn Campbell, you know? Mm -hmm. Not to mention for us, because, you know, we do a lot of jumping around, a lot of partying, and a lot of, you know, you know a good half of our shows is, is success, I think, is based in the energy and the rawness and the primitive, you know, male stuff that we do. Yeah. But then, you know, it'll be nice to, uh, what do you call, woodshed or, you know, find sandpaper down some of our edges and... And, and work on that part of our performance yeah. for that audience. Not that we're going to change completely, but there are some things that we that we do do according to the people we open for. And so it'll be, it'll be nice to to see what a, a, a vintage trouble love making set is like, opposed to the word that starts with F and ends with K. <laughs> Very diplomatic. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, We've just been interrupted by the lead singer from Sly Diggs. We actually got interrupted by the bass, bass player. Oh, bass player, was it? Sorry, I thought that was yeah. a singer then. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. All those um, Warrington guys, they, just, oh, they, they look alike. They all look the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. They definitely yeah. sound the same. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's too true, yeah. Um, you're now going out with support bands in the UK when you never have previously. Um, you mentioned the troublemakers already. You tended to like the ambience created by the DJs you took out before. Mm -hmm. What are they? What's the feedback about the bands you're taking out? What, what are you? You know, really what are good. they saying? I think it's also a, a give and take thing. We've been so many bands been helping us to, uh, you know, we got to support amazing legendary acts, and it's time for us to step up. And you know, we're getting upper level so for us it means a lot to bring someone upcoming as well and they've yeah. been dear friends of us. we toured with them last year and right. it was so much fun and they're kind of part of our whole troublemaker community now you know so it's kind of a family tour this year you know? they're so, rowdy and they like to party yeah, so they, you know yeah. we're, 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 we're all good with that yeah. we're all good with that I think in the past we got messed up because you know a lot of times a lot of opening acts 
it's based in politics mm -hmm. and you end up having people mm -hmm. open for you that don't that aren't the right people to be opening for you and then you are doing your audiences a disservice but I think like they were saying because slide digs you know not only come from a backbone that's 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 woven of the Who and the Rolling Stones and so much of the rock and roll part of Vintage Trouble, you know, it just makes sense. And then, you know, it, they just, they've really become like family. It's really weird seeing them after not having seen them for a while. You know, they walk into the room and just the amount of connection that you reminded that you had, it was actually a little mind blowing. You uh, forgot how, how connected we were. Yeah. And then right now, I mean, I mean, like, we're in their dressing room, is why would they why? Yes, they yeah, but I mean, a lot of times we're in each happen. other's dressing rooms, and it's just, you know, we definitely party together till the sun comes up a lot. And, you know, we give each other raw eggs and tomatoes in the morning when we mm -hmm. need to get over a hangover. But it's, it's, it's actually really nice to actually expand the road, our family. I saw them supporting The Who, actually, in the Motor Point Arena. Yeah. And that was probably the tour after you'd supported mm -hmm. The Who when you did the Quadrophenia tour yeah. with them. Yeah, which I was gutted not to be able to go to see actually because I was away working away. So what was it like, you know, with working with the Who, for example? Well, that must have been for me. That would have been like mind blowing. But it was cool because it started off like such a short tour. I think originally it was just ten days, and they kind of kept asking like, "Oh, you guys could do a little longer." And we ended up fifty-two shows with them, and it was incredible. Because you know, it wasn't just the UK either, was it? No. It was, yeah. World tours. Yeah, it yeah. was very, very special. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, same thing happened with ACDC too. We were supposed to just do some, you know, like a, a short tour, and then it got extended and extended, and then we went back to the stage with them. And you know, we're from Los Angeles, so it was great because that tour ended at Dodger Stadium. So you can imagine living in LA. <laughs> And yeah. you know you run into your friends during the day, and you know not that you need these kind of things in your life. Right, 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 right. But when someone asks you, you know, oh, you're tonight? back in town, where you're playing tonight? You're like, yeah. you know, Dodgers Stadium. They're like, where are you like Dodgers Stadium? Like, where are you like Dodgers Stadium? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, I had nothing to do at the end of that night too, and I wanted to just be able to go somewhere, and just, you know, because the funny thing is, you go home and go to your bed you just, from Dodger Stadium, you yeah. go sleep in your own bed, you know. Yeah. But I wanted to go somewhere and be like. You know, we just played it, you know, Dodger Stadium, but I had no idea, so I just went straight home mm -hmm. to bed. Jesse Mallon said exactly the same thing when he said about degeneration support in Kiss at Madison Square Garden, mm. and he said everybody was there, and they were going, where are you going? And he said, I'm going back to bed. Yeah. And he was like, well, we just supported fucking Kiss, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You right. can't just go back to bed. From Dodger Stadium to my bed. Right? Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, I didn't go to bed that night. Yeah. <laughs> Good man. Mm. Good man. But I go to bed midnight. Nine, nine, nine. Yeah, it was like disco. It was on Monday night. I only remember that because I went to like Motown Mondays at this pretty cool. Bar. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah, and, and I could, and I could point it. There's a question I wanted to ask you, which kind of I didn't know whether to ask you or whether. Uh, but seeing as you've raised the fact that you you make a stand, and you yes, I'm black. Is no, it no, a no. Bit of sexual <laughs> nature? <laughs> What's that? Is it a bit of sexual nature? No, 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 no. no, no. It's, it's it's actually about um, the rise of far right politics at the moment in the world. Mm -hmm. And I can't say I'm particularly proud to say I'm British at the moment, the way we've just sure. voted to leave the EU and everything else, but that's my own politics. Mm. You said I, you can, you can, you are yeah. proud or not proud? I'm not proud, no. no. Yeah. Because of the reasons I've just said to you about going to Hellfest and places mm. like that yeah. and actually feeling part of that sure. whole community, yeah. wherever you're from. Sure. Um, I just wanted to ask you what you thought of Donald Trump, if I'm honest with you, and his very outspoken... And Yeah, I, I, yeah. I mean, it, I... So much, it feels like the whole world now, so much is reacting to fear. Yeah. And, you know, we, there's something that, you know, it's been kind of going around the whole world. And I understand that there's been a lot of involvement for a long time with bad things. And, and now they're using fear to get people to do, uh, vote for crazy things. Yeah. And it happens in the States as well. And luckily, you know, we're musicians, at least, you know, even we... We definitely got political opinions, but the main thing for us is to play live and get people together. And you know, and, and the way Ty talks during the shows and to, to bring people together, understand that it's better to be united than separated. It, it's it's with so much fear going on. Everybody wants to put up borders, get everyone, and it's me against you and all this. Like, yeah, and you know, you look different than me, and and. It's just based on fear, and it's really sad, and a lot of people are thriving on it, which... And making really money makes, from it. Yeah, well, that's, that's, that's actually the big point, is I don't think the actual fear concept is anything new. I mean, you know, well, people trying to get power now, have been used fear. Well, they're just using the different mediums, you know, mm -hmm. that's available now, and 
Donald Trump, you know, keep in mind, people in our country, they, you know, they think of him as an outsider politically, but re realistically, he's been contributing large sums of money to political campaigns for 30 years, and he's been a figurehead in the media in our country, uh, albeit from a business standpoint, for 30 years. And I think what the interesting thing is politics has just gotten so divisive that what happens is the more you can use what knowledge is just saying now, as far as with you know uh, the social media taglines and little Twitter blips and stuff like that, to the more sensational you can be, the more you can sort of uh, you know coalesce people around around you. And unfortunately, which what that does is it definitely does pull people into their own specific homogenous corner. You know, and so in, a, in, a, in our country, it's the same thing that's happening here. You're, 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 you hit it on the head when you said it's really far right politics, which ultimately, it's, it's for, for people like us, you can look at it, and far right politics is just manipulating the bottom that are really uninformed or misinformed, right? Because far right is, is dealing and trying to get control of a, of, a, of a portion of money that nobody, no regular people will ever, ever see, nor will any of the decisions that they're really making, you know, you know what affect them in the way that it affects the people at the top. So it's, it's really kind of a bait and switch thing. I have a theory about Donald Trump that he actually never wanted to be president. He just wanted the power to create a television station. So I'm going to see if we come out of this. Let's watch this in a year from now. I think yeah. he wanted to. He gets, he, he gave, what they say he got $2 billion worth of coverage for free in this primary election that the other candidates couldn't get. And he's, he's pissed off because CNN, MSNBC, Fox um, is all making money off of him. And now he's got so many people by his side that he wants to do the Rupert Murdoch thing. And he put a line right in the middle of Fox News. And he just basically wants to go and fight Fox News for the, you know, the far right crazy on the other side. And he doesn't care about the politics. He cares about the power that the money can create from controlling a news station that puts out whatever it wants to put out in the way of disinformation. Sorry, I'm laughing because I can't comprehend what crazier than Fox News must look like. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. No, you're absolutely right. But... Keep in mind, I mean, he, he, he used to show up to WWF wrestling matches, you know, yeah, to, do, yeah. to do skits at wrestling matches. His, which yeah, are, his, television, his show. television show was full-on, complete sensationalism reality-based, right? Yeah. And so you're dealing with a guy that, that, you know, from a diplomatic standpoint, you know, as far as true, uh, you know, educated leaders, you know, who are up-to-date on foreign affairs and, and the panache that it takes to deal with, you know, the diplomacy of having to deal with leaders from all over the place. He's not interested in any of that. He doesn't, he's, he's outclassed. He was outclassed before he ever got into it. So it's just more a power grab, I think. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I, I knew that was no, a no, no, pretty no, no, heavy no, no, question. Yeah, it's an interesting thing it's because... It's interesting, too, because, um, you know, there's got to be a silver lining to most clouds. And mm -hmm. the fact that he, it's been as odd as it's been, it's made more people pay attention. And I mean, I've never been, I've never seen an election happen that's had m as many people paying attention for this long a period of time. Because mm -hmm. so it's a long process. It's, it's a long it's process. Too long. 18 crazy yeah. long, but at least maybe it's it's more people will probably vote this time than ever. And so maybe there's an awareness <clears throat> that it's caused to happen that might not have been there without it. Hopefully, the awareness is worth. In favor of Brexit. Yeah, 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 but obviously, thing. you guys had a landslide voting thing here. Well, it, was it was a landslide. landslide. It was very narrow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I didn't mean like, but it was oh, people sorry. came out and voted more oh, yeah, than yeah, ever, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, even if, but it was close. But not the youth vote, no, no, which no, no, actually represents the. Yeah, but I I mean, it's the same thing. People do come out and want to vote when it is, when fear is involved and. It's about protecting it. But it's, just peop it, it's just easy for the news to put so much fear in people I, I where they pick yeah. the safest thing, and that is to think of building a wall or set, throw people out who doesn't look like you or feel like you, and it's, it's not the right thing. I don't know what it's going to take, an uh, alien invasion to unite people in the world to understand with just one thing. I could go off on a different tangent there about yeah. conspiracy theories, but I'm not going to, which, okay. is, which is actually about yeah, that. Drink to yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Immigration, and immigrants are actually good, man. There's a lot of, there's a lot of information out there that is, that is proven that you know Absolutely. immigrants actually yeah. want to assimilate into society, they want to pay taxes, yeah. in which case it actually raises the, the actual GDP base, and it's proven. Yeah. So, But if you get people to think that, to be scared of the immigrants, well then what they'll do is they'll close up and vote for you know, leaving yeah, a union yeah, that yeah, makes yeah. them stronger. Yeah, or, or I hope though that with with the time that we're in, because in the past this work, I haven't really seen it really be affected this time. Is that people do start media, big media like radio, Clearwater, they start releasing songs to the world 
that are songs that will help heal the world. Because yeah. some people won't get details, but if they hear something, if they start singing melodies and singing lyrics to songs like Blowing in the Wind and What's Going On and Jeez. all these kind of things, yeah. you know, and it's up to the media because you know people are going to listen to whatever they're fed. So hopefully some of these... More musicians, first of all, will start writing songs to help with the consciousness of the time. But then also, once they're written, I hope people will take it on themselves to make sure that those songs get heard. Mm -hmm. Bob Marley pulled. Though, there's, there's not a lot of money in that, so, you know. Yeah. But Bob Marley pulled, uh, you know, pulled the two civil warring faction leaders, you know, on one stage and yeah. got them to shake hands. And, you know, it caused change, so, you know, you can do it. One hopeful road, obviously, first time I've actually mentioned the, the, the new album, mm -hmm. which is now a year old. Um, I just wondered what, you know, a year down the line, touring the album and everything else, how you feel about it now? I just wondered, what, when you look at it now, what does it mean to you as a record? Well, it means different things every day. So I think um, today, like, because, you know, we've been doing this singing soundtrack, we've been practicing a lot of songs, we did a couple from the record, and um, this, I, just, I really, really, really love the songs in the record. I think it's got a real introspective feel. Yeah, yeah, no, you it feels more it. like a soul record to me. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Well, and it's it's a it's a journal from our time together. You know, there was we spent a lot of time on the road before that, and I felt like it was kind of a, a what we wanted to put out, what came through us. You know, through touring four or five years together. And, you know, we waited yeah. long for it, man. We waited I know. a long time We're together, not wait and, this long. and it's really grown on me as a record. It's one of those records, the first time I heard it, I thought, man, it's all right. Yeah. And now, I actually prefer it to the first album. So, oh, wow. thank you. You know, oh, uh, yeah, it's really, really grown on me. Yeah. It really has. It's great. And I said it's the more reflective elements of the record, mm -hmm. and I'll probably be the one crying tonight. Uh, mm -hmm. So, some of the slower tracks, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Uh, and I wanted to finish with just uh, like a quirky question then, just so we can let the slide digs get on stage, um, which is the four of you have been told you've got to go away, spend a month on a, on a desert island. But you're only allowed one LP, yeah, one film, one book, and one TV show. So you can have one each if you want, but you can take with you to keep you sane <laughs> when, like you, when you've got a month on a desert <laughs> island together. Yeah. the first. So book. Let's do a book. Anybody want to do a book? A you've book. got one book. Yeah, I'll take The Alchemist. Yeah? Yeah, and I think just because I, I started reading again recently and because I needed to be reminded about finding the gold <laughs> okay. and what it literally means not not just figuratively and what it figuratively means not just literally those two things are important because a lot of times we get so success based that we forget about the spirit and when we get so spiritual based you forget to not be taken advantage of so I would say the alchemist okay. Okay. Stratford, well, we were at Stratford on A1 yesterday so I'll, I'll take the whole complete works of Shakespeare it's in one book <laughs> Wait, no, you, need, you don't need a book you need four questions oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. oh okay well then television show um, television show uh, I'm gonna go Breaking Bad man it's just, it's just I it's thought bad. you were going to say vinyl because if well it was only one season I'd be, I'd be done I'd be, unfortunately I'd be one and done man I'd be one and like done game change yeah. the TV yeah, but Breaking Bad I'll say Breaking Bad uh, I spotted the one straight away, by the way. I did. I spot. I didn't know when I spotted it straight away. So no, it's it's got to be time. Uh, no, yeah. It's got to be time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we've got one al album. I'll say a movie. I would say Goodfellas. That's one of my favorites. I've seen it probably 25 times. Yeah, so what a film. It's amazing. Yeah. So an album's left? Yeah. I can't believe the album was last. <laughs> <laughs> I would go with... Um, such a tough one. Eric Satie was a, you know, a All composer right. from the 18th century. And he's got these... Great piano pieces called the Genepses. Yeah, and it's just it's music that is so simple, but it is so haunting, and it just gets right into you, and you could never ever get tired of it. Um, I've heard it in various forms all over the world. It shows up in film. It shows up everywhere. These things called the Genepses by. Uh, Eric Satie, which is a composer. Okay. Wow. And that's probably the most surreal ending to an interview I've ever had. Thank you guys. Thank, thank you. Time.